Um, a week ago um, today, I was sat uh, with two people who said, um, we'll pick him up from the airport at Newquay. Um, and I thought, who are these two people? And they're people who set up an, an organization called Operation Encompass. Uh, and I don't know how many people know about Operation Encompass, but it, I'm going to make it my mission as national president to make sure that everybody does know about Operation Encompass. And Operation Encompass is an organization that is, uh, puts at its front and center uh, keeping children safe uh, and, and helping to address the sort of mental health issues that children have when they come into school, maybe that they've picked up from home. And it's about the police working with schools far more closely. Um, and as they were treating me to dinner in Newquay, they said, um, um, have you heard of Dr. Warren Larkin? And I thought, I've seen that name somewhere before. <laughs> and, um, and I looked um, on my, my, um, my agenda for today, and obviously Warren's name was there. And apart from being a, a fellow Northwesterner, um, he, his, his knowledge and expertise is widely accepted and, and, and respected. Um, across the, the, the community that we work with. Um, just to fill in some of the, the background, if you don't know about Warren, uh, Warren's a consultant clinical psychologist, a visiting professor at Sunderland University, and clinical lead for the Department of Health Adverse Childhood Experiences Programme. And uh, I know you'll be dying to know what Warren has to say. I'm really looking forward to what Warren has to say. So I wonder if you could put your hands together and welcome our first keynote, which is Dr. Warren Larkin. Hello. Is this working? Yeah. Thanks very much. That's a really kind introduction. And thanks, Catherine, for inviting me. I feel quite humbled, actually, to be asked to present the keynote, because I'm just this bloke from Wigan who's interested in trauma and how it affects people so yeah anyway so I'll get the imposter syndrome out of the way I'll, I'll, I'll just ease back into the role that I, you know the the facade that I put on the, the you know the veneer uh, thinly thinly laid veneer um, first of all I've got to say I, apologies because I'm absolutely exhausted this morning um, Lynn Green who's the clinical director for place to be took took me from the hotel to this venue via a five mile forced march. Um, I've just had to sneak a banana in because my blood sugar's like all over the place. I'm literally exhausted. Um, so there's a warning there for everybody willing enough to take you to the venue. Uh, but Lynn, we, Lynn and I used to work together. Um, Lynn was the lead for lead consultant psychologist for CAMS. I was a clinical director for Children and Family Services in Lancashire. Um, before that, I worked in psychosis services in um, Manchester and then Lancashire and I've, since day one I've always had an interest in psychosis, in mental health, in vulnerability, substance misuse, why people struggle and don't cope, you know, and we're all on that continuum somewhere, you know, we all kind of get to a point where we can't cope, but some people have more challenge than others, I think. And I think a lot of that starts in their early life, family environment and school. I think school's got a huge part to play in it. So, my title is modestly, my, my talk is modestly titled, uh, Rooted Inquiry About Adversity in Childhood. Why asking the right questions can change the world. So I've got some, some sort of grandiose delusions going on as well, but I do, I do genuinely think asking the right questions can change the world. I was last, this week, for the last four days, I've been in Cornwall training drug and alcohol services. Uh, they work with young people from 10 and up, but also with adults and families. Uh, they work into criminal justice and they're doing some harm reduction work in schools, which is amazing. So they're going into schools and actually talking to students about how they use drugs, which is an interesting one because most of the teachers don't like to acknowledge the fact that their students use drugs and neither do the parents, but they do. And they go in and have honest conversations with children about how to do that safely if they're gonna do it. Or better still, not to do it, but yeah, let's be realistic. Okay, so I'll get back to the point. Um, I work with those very varied and diverse professionals and the bottom line is they don't ask the people that they work with what happened to them why did they start using drugs why why did they become dependent on alcohol it's not a lifestyle choice for for the people that they work with it's a way of coping it's a way of managing the distress the pain the emptiness but they still don't ask people what happened to them they do lots of assessments and tick box exercises but not getting to the bottom of it. When did, it, when did you start to feel 
that you couldn't cope, that you, you felt empty, that you felt in pain? When did you start using drugs as a way of managing that? So for them, this has been quite transformational. They find out why people are using drugs, not just the fact they're using them and ask them to stop using them or use them more safely. They actually find out why it started. So it sounds, you know, on a way it sounds ridiculous <laughs> that we have to kind of deliver some training or support to get professionals to do this, but professionals don't like doing this because they're worried they'll upset people or they'll make it worse or they'll already make a vulnerable person feel more vulnerable. And the phrase that comes up all the time is open a can of worms. Every single, I'm gonna get a t-shirt with a can of worms on it because um, 20, 30 times in the past four days people have said, I don't know open a can of worms. So I'm gonna, I think I'm going to bust that myth a little bit. Anyway, I've got a big button that says next, so I'll press that and see if anything happens. There we are. So, oh, I can move around because I've got this. So, um, <laughs> this is good. First thing you'll notice is a tremendous sense of style <laughs> and uh, panache. I couldn't afford a Lionel Scott jumper in the day, so I got a, a gabichi, a diamond gabichi, which I was very proud of. Um, so I, I grew up in Wigan, um, working class lad, didn't like school, didn't, didn't experience school as a safe, positive, nurturing environment. My, my school experience was characterised by threat, harassment, violence, chaos, and that was, that was just the teachers. <laughs> it's true, I'm, I'm not joking, it, it was, that's what it was like, and my peers reflected the same, you know. So I, I, I went to school with a lot of people who couldn't self-regulate, who had very challenging behaviour. Uh, probably be diagnosed with ADHD now, probably be diagnosed with conduct disorder. Um, but it was a scary place. And while I wasn't systematically bullied, I was bullied at times and beaten up. And it was not a good place to learn. It was not a good learning environment. I wouldn't put up with it for my kids now if that was the case. But then it was kind of just seen as that's, that's how it was, you know. But it was a dreadful experience, actually. I was just, you know, my main goal for the day was just to get through it and survive, you know. So when I left, it was a huge relief. Um, but I left school with, I think, two, one O level, I think, was it one O level and one CSC? CSC was in woodwork. O level was in uh, religious studies, which on, the, on paper, not really that useful. Unless, of course, as someone pointed out yesterday, you want to be Jesus. In which case, work, work for Jesus. Work for Jesus' dad, didn't it? So, but in Wigan, the second coming wasn't due, so I, I, was, I went for an apprenticeship at Bulldog Tools in Wigan. We met garden tools, and I failed the apprenticeship because I'd failed technical drawing, I'd failed maths, I'd failed English. So I came out, you know, I thought I was quite bright, but actually, clearly I wasn't because I failed on, you know, most of my exams. Um, couldn't get an apprenticeship because I didn't have maths and English. Um, Prospects not looking good. My educational attainment did not predict a great deal for me, really. A lot of my peers went down the route of getting manual jobs, being addicted to substances, um, criminal justice involvement. And I could see I could have gone down that direction, definitely. Um, I've got quite an addictive personality. I've got, I need constant stimulation. You know, I kind of needed excitement, needed stimulation, needed. You just, I, mean, I was never satisfied, I always needed something, so I was a bit of a risk taker as well. Fortunately, I, just, I realised that unless I got maths and English, I wasn't going to get very far. I wasn't even going to get an apprenticeship. All the pits had shut, so was, I couldn't go and dig coal like my dad and my granddad. Um, not a lot of options. I couldn't even dig coal with the shovels that they made at Bulldog Tools that I could get an apprenticeship for. So it was doubly terrible. Um, so I went sixth form. Uh, there's a school down the road, sixth form college. I thought, I'll do maths and English, and then I'll be able to get an apprenticeship. It'll be all good. Anyway, I'm going to pause there. I'm going to fill in the gaps later. Um, so I did all right. Um, I'm nothing special. I'm just, I, I often think I, most of my career was an accident. Um, but I did better than my careers teacher expected. My careers teacher said, you're too stupid to do levels, get an apprenticeship. Um, but I've done some interesting things in my career. How come is the question. Given my educational attainment and my school performance, did not predict that, what happened. So adverse child experiences, ACEs. Um, how many of you are familiar with that term? Oh, marvellous, that's fabulous. I did, this, I did a similar talk in um, 
I won't say were actually, so a group of GPs, 100 GPs, and about three, three of them put their hand up, which is worrying. But yeah, the ACEs, the adverse child experiences, the things that we describe, that when we say ACEs, the things that that refers to is this list. These are things we know most about. So uh, nine categories of experience, physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, and then there's living with a household, what they call household dysfunction, which is not very nice, but living with someone who abuses drugs, has serious mental health problems, being exposed to domestic violence and domestic abuse, which is um, what Andy was referring to, Operation Encompass tries to help kids who are exposed to domestic abuse by getting the police to come and tell the school the next day before the child gets there that they've been exposed to domestic violence so that the school can respond and support the child's emotional needs rather than giving them a hard time because they've turned up with dirty uniform or no lunch money or you know not paying attention because they're tired. So it's, that's an amazing thing. Um, living with someone who's been to prison, uh, living with someone who's got a serious mental health problem, which I think is often overlooked. Um, on so many other levels, I won't get distracted and, and go into that, but and parental loss through divorce, death or abandonment. So they're the most common things. That list is not exhaustive. This last four days, working with drug and alcohol services, I asked them to make a list of the things that they've seen in people's lives that have affected their well-being and their ability to cope later on. We had a list of about 100 things by the end of those four days. Being a, being a young carer, you know, um, living in, a, in, a, in an area where there's a lot of violence or you feel threatened, being subject to stigma due to your sexuality or your race or your religion, um, being bullied. There's all kinds of things that affect people's well-being, but these are things we know most about from a research perspective. Jane, what's her name? Jane Simmons. Jane. Jane, anyway, who, who creates the <laughs> Jane who creates the ACES Connection website. And if you're not if you're not signed up to the ACES Connection website, do so because it's an amazing supportive group of people who are interested in this area. Um, I, I signed up and post questions, and lots of people from all over the world come back and tell me what the answers are. You know, it's brilliant. Uh, Vincent Felitti is on there quite a lot. He answers lots of questions. Um, so Jane, sorry, I can't remember her second name, has very helpfully said there's probably five areas of our science. Um, so I'm going with that, and I'll tell you a little bit about it. First one's epidemiology, study of population health, study of populations. In England, about half of the population report at least one of the things on that list. 9% of the population say they've had four or more of those experiences. So it's quite common. And the other thing that we notice from 20 years of research is, I was just checking that spelled causal right, because I did, yesterday I put some slides up and it said casual, not causal. <laughs> so although I did get my, my English O level, it obviously it hasn't, it hasn't worked that much. Um, so the causal and proportionate relationship there's a cumulative impact of trauma and adversity on people's lives. Generally, the bigger the dose of adversity, the worse people's outcomes, the more they struggle. Um, and we know that relates to physical health, emotional health, and social outcomes. It's not inevitable, it's not determinism. You know, resilience factors play a role in all of that. And you can have people with very high A scores who are doing very well, thank you. you know? But if you observe a population, the bigger the dose of toxic stress, the worse people's outcomes generally speaking. And that's an important finding because if it's causal, if it's predictable, we can actually prevent it, can't we? It's important. The original study was 20 years ago. And what I think is interesting is we haven't been ready to hear this message and have this debate for 20 years. It's seriously, five years ago, this, this would not have happened. We would not be having a conference entitled Adverse Child Experiences. And okay, it wouldn't have happened. Um, it's only in the last five years they let me into the Royal College of Psychiatrists to do a talk, actually. So culture takes a long time to, and that was only because I was carrying my boss's uh, briefcase. <laughs> he hurt his back, I was carrying his briefcase, so they thought, he's got a trained psychologist, he brings with him you know, to these meetings. <laughs> it's quite funny. Um, <laughs> so this study was 20 years ago, which is a long time, but culture takes time, you know, quite a long time to change. If you think about the time it took for us to understand that Smoking causes lung cancer for more than half the people that do it. That was 27 years from the Surgeon General's report to the point where we banned it in public. We did something about it on a population level. 27 years. If that was poison, you know, if that was like um, arsenic in the water, <laughs> and we saw it affecting people's health, we'd sort it out in about a week, wouldn't we? But because it's a cultural thing and it's complex and it's about behaviour and attitude and 
money, actually, as well. It takes a while. So possibly because the health and social care system and the care system, the criminal justice system are struggling in a big way, maybe we're ready to hear it. Also, I think probably because we've had, you know, all of these very public abuse scandals, Savile, um, you know, the football situation, um, you know, the children's homes in North Wales, the Me Too you know, people are coming forward and seeing that actually people don't, you know, people do believe you, people do support you. It's not, it's not a terrible thing. People actually are quite supportive. So I, I think there are a number of reasons why we're ready to hear this now. Anyway, Kaiser study was 20 years ago and it was, it happened by accident as most great scientific discoveries do. Um, Vincent Felitti was working in obesity. Um, he was seeing patients that were seriously ill because of their weight. He developed a treatment called absolute supplemented fasting, which basically means people stop eating altogether, and then they have like a vitamin drink to stop them dying of scurvy. You know, seriously, they just—they literally just have the nutrients that stop them from getting sick. But after four thousand people, he thought he, he thought he was going to get a Nobel Prize. He found a treatment that was safe. You know, some of his patients lost three hundred pounds in, in the space of nine months. He, he was onto a winner. He thought, yeah, this is it. You know, I'm going to be famous because I've found this treatment for obesity. Um, six months of review, people were coming back, and after this huge life-changing effort that they put in, you know, they were going to have to have joint reconstruction, they, were, they had terrible um, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, they were quite sick, and they turned their lives around. But they came back after six months and put more weight on than they'd lost in the first place in a shorter period of time, and he, he was baffled by that. Long story short, um, he interviewed many of his patients and discovered two things. The first thing was, this wasn't about diet or education or about lifestyle, and this was about the intrinsic nature of their childhood. He found out that basically people were using food as a self-soothing mechanism, as a psychoactive substance. They used it to feel better, but then after a little while they didn't feel better anymore. They felt empty and sad and in pain, so they ate more. And that was the pattern. So basically, it was the coping strategy. It was a compulsive, self-soothing strategy. And they weren't going to give it up in a hurry because they had, what he hadn't given them was another way of coping that was better. He just took away the, the thing that they had, which is interesting. And if you look at bariatric surgery now, we see it as a medical success story. People lose 30% of the body weight, 40%, and they, they become more healthy. But there's also a very high rate of suicide and other addictions tend to follow because you take away a coping strategy and you don't replace it with anything. It seems pretty straightforward, but we still medicalize and we still have this, you know, this mind-body separation in, in the way we approach um, health problems and social problems. In the, in the original study, the other thing that he found was that many of his patients had been abused or lived in a house that was very chaotic or dysfunctional. And some of his female patients when he interviewed them, said they'd been sexually abused and they, f they felt when they were obese and overweight that they were less vulnerable to sexual assault. That was one of the psychological reasons that they felt safer and it served a function. The male, some of his male patients said they felt less vulnerable to physical assault and exploitation because they, they, one of his clients said they could throw the weight around to a big guy. People didn't mess with them. So this was more complicated than was first thought. It's not a medical problem. This is a social problem. Without, without exception, his, his clients had either his functional childhood or had been exposed to abuse or neglect. So he decided on send a question, sending a questionnaire out to members of the Kaiser Health Plan. So it was a private health care plan. Um, middle class America, people who could afford private health care in San Diego, they sent out a questionnaire to 17,000 people and about 10,000 people sent it back. Before I move on, I'll just say that in addition to finding a dose-response relationship, they also found that ACEs, because they have a kind of managed healthcare system in San Diego, they provide pretty much everything, so they can follow people around the system. They found not only does it predict, do, do you know, bigger, greater exposure to ACEs, not only predicts chronic disease, such as cancer, heart disease, mental illness, violence, becoming the victim of violence, but it also, <coughs> excuse me, create, uh, predicted absenteeism from work. People with higher A scores were off work more often. They used crisis services more often. They were more likely to be involved in criminal justice um, 
they were more likely to have mental health problems. So the costs associated with that were enormous. Kaiser, Kaiser in San Diego have a $4 billion budget every year. So there's a big human cost. There's also a big economic cost. <coughs> Not a surprise then that after these findings, Kaiser made this, uh, they de established a department of preventative medicine. And they asked all of their patients about adversity now. Specifically, they found that if people experienced four or more adversities compared with someone who had none, it increased the odds of them having uh, using illicit drugs by five times. It also increased the odds of them self-reporting as an alcoholic by seven times, so it's probably an underestimate. And also predicted a 12 times increased risk of attempting suicide. So this was huge. This is, you don't see these kinds of, um, these kinds of odds ratios and, and relative risk in epidemiology generally. These are, these are massive. In England, we did a, an ACE study, as I mentioned earlier, and we found similar things. You know, if you've, if you've had four ACEs compared to somebody who's had none, you are six times more likely to have caused or had an unplanned teenage pregnancy, which has significant social and intergenerational effects very often. You're also seven times more likely to have been the victim or the perpetrator of violence in the last year, and 11 times more likely to have used crack or heroin, or have been to prison, or youth offenders institution. <coughs> Excuse me. The other thing we know is that secondary brain science, uh, ACE science, is, is brain science. I think, we, I think it's fairly intuitive that when a child's neglected, severely neglected, their brain doesn't develop and mature in the same way that a child who's in a nurturing environment does. What, what happens when a child is exposed to toxic stress, you know, long periods of fear, intimidation, physiological arousal, that has an impact on the way the brain adapts as well. So that fight or flight response was not designed for long periods of activation. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. Thank you. <coughs> Even I didn't know I needed a drink of water. <laughs> ah, marvellous. So, uh, yeah. Your brain adapts. So when you're exposed to toxic stress, it's not, not designed that in a fight or flight system. Designed for short, explosive bursts of energy to fight or escape. Not designed for long periods, years, months. <clears throat> so that has an impact on the brain. Brain adapts to that. And ultimately, that stress response system becomes dysregulated. And that not only affects the architecture of brain, the architecture of your brain and the way your organs develop, but it also increases the risk of stress-related diseases and inflammatory conditions. as an impact on the body. It's, there's a whole field of science called psychoimmunoendocrine. What is it? Psychoimmunoendocrine immunology. Yeah, it's a bit of a mouthful, isn't it? But it's basically the science of the mind-body connection, the, the impact of chronic stress on the physio physiology and development of the brain. Um, and there's some pretty stunning... Science going on, there's a, there's a paper called 1,000 Days Australia, which looks at the first 1,000 days of a child's life from kind of conception to the second year. Um, it's incredible what we can predict from the point of conception, actually preconception, in terms of a child's health and well-being. The social circumstances of the parents predict a lot in terms of your emotional state, your ability to cope, epigenetics, all of those things, which I'll talk more about in a minute. <coughs> But this discipline of psychoneuroimmunology, they've got to find a better name. Basically looks at the way the mind and emotions affect the body. And I guess the, the thing to the kind of make sense of is that all affects our immune system. So if, you're, if, you're stress, if your stress system is activated, that then has an impact on your immune system. It affects your, your hormonal system, but that in turn, that fight or flight trigger affects your, immune, your immunology. So you kind of uh, release infl inflammatory cells because there's a chance you might get injured, so you need to repair that part of your body. But that sets you up for certain kinds of illnesses and disease, diseases later on in life. It also actually suppresses the production of brain cells, of brain matter in the developing child. In those first three years, three quarters of brain development happens. So there are all kinds of, you're setting up a whole set of um, potentials and, and predispositions and kind of likelihoods, relative risks, odds. Basically, your immune system gets worn out. 
your brain doesn't develop appropriately and you have a dysregulated stress system. That's the summary. So over the life course, very quickly, people who, this is, this is developed from Centers for Disease Control and, and Vincent Felitis Kaiser organization. Higher exposure to adversity leads to a disrupted hormonal nervous system and immune development. That leads to social, emotional and learning problems. So if you're full of adrenaline and cortisol, um, you, you're constantly at a high state of arousal, you can't self-regulate, you can't self-soothe. And also at the same time, you constantly need stimulation because you haven't got as many dopamine, dopamine receptors as your peers because you've not had that attunement in childhood, in, you know, in infancy. You're going to struggle to learn. It'd be impossible to learn, basically. So those children that tend to attract you know, negative attention because they're withdrawn or they can't concentrate or they're fidgeting or they can't sit still or they're explosive and unpredictable, they're the ones who, who are displaying the, the symptoms of trauma, essentially. And that's where this whole trauma-sensitive school movement came from because teachers were realizing that they couldn't manage and, and teach and convey learning to certain children. And then that was probably because they were matching that child's needs to what they were offering. The thing that happens is you leave school with no qualifications. You're seen as someone who's, who's trouble. You have <laughs> conduct disorder or ADHD or you just think you're not very smart or like I do when I left school. You kind of... Um, you adopt ways of coping. Some of those ways of coping harm your health. So if you're in pain, you might use heroin. It's a great pain killer, but it's gonna damage your health ultimately and, and create massive needs for you to commit crime to feed your habit. Um, you, might sm you, know, you might smoke, you might use food, you might gamble. You're gonna find a way of feeling better. But those things can damage, damage your health, damage your relationships, damage communities, and ultimately it makes it hard to contribute via education or involvement in the community or, or holding down a job. And what we see if we observe populations over time is that if people have got higher doses of adversity, they tend to die sooner. So if you've got six aces, you're more likely to die 20 years sooner than your contemporaries who haven't got any aces. And finally, in terms of this ace science, and I will, I will speed up a bit after this, um, Really fascinating. We've got to a point now where we're saying, okay, let's not say what's wrong with you. Let's say what happened to you. That's a better thing. Yeah? As soon as we say what's wrong with you, we go, oh, yeah, they've got a personality disorder or they've got an eating disorder. We stop asking questions. We stop asking about that person's life, about their subjective experience, about their whole experience as a person. We just go, yeah, they've got this condition and we need to treat that. So the GP knows all about my back problems. He knows nothing about my social circumstances, about my, the way I manage stress, what happened to me when I was young, how I'm wired up. He doesn't know anything about that. He just knows about my organs <laughs> and my blood. Um, what this study tells us, Rachel Huda uh, did a study in Israel of Holocaust survivors, and she found that the offspring of Holocaust survivors have a, have a stress hormone profile which makes them vulnerable to anxiety disorders and mood problems. They're more, more likely to have panic disorders. It kind of makes sense. So epigenetics mean epigenetic means above the genome. It, it's about the propensity for a gene to switch on and off in response to environmental or social conditions. Um, if you're living in a situation where you're in constant threat, you're in constant danger, and it's a, it's a case of survival, it kind of makes sense for your offspring to have genes programmed to switch on in relation to stress, fear, survival more readily than their contemporaries. That makes sense. It gives you an evolutionary advantage. So actually asking what happened to our parents and our grandparents is valuable as well. It's part of our formulation. It's part of our understanding. And me, me finding that out was incredible because I realized that my mum and dad's experience and what they went through in their lives makes a lot of sense to me because I have these weird anxiety episodes that make no sense. Um, and I do, I do get triggered more readily than, than a lot of people I know. Um, as a cognitive therapist, I kind of know what's going on in my head. I have metacognitive insight, but it still doesn't stop it happening because um, I have that propensity. And thanks, mum and dad, for that. That's <coughs> it's always good to remind them. Philip Larkin was right <laughs> about your mum and dad. So the good news is we can prevent this. Because it's so predictable, we can prevent it. We just need to reduce the impact of adversity on people's lives. From the English A study, from the statistical model 
They worked out that if we could reduce the impact of ACEs on future generations, we could see a reduction in unintended teenage pregnancy by almost 40%, which would be incredible. We could see a reduction in heroin use by 60%. Violence would go down by 50% as a victim or a perpetrator, and half as many people go to prison. So we could, most of the social ills and, and problems we have in our healthcare system and our social environment could be reduced massively by minimising the impact of adversity. Bad stuff happening to people makes it hard for them to cope and live functional lives later on. It isn't rocket science. And sometimes I think, am I really studying talking about this? Yeah, I am. I am studying talking about this, which is good. But I've been doing it for 25 years, and, and we're seeing progress. We're seeing progress in terms of recognising we deal with trauma, but we're still not making a lot of progress in prevention, as far as I can see. So we know from, from global studies that um, if we were to reduce the impact of adversity on populations, we'd see overall probably a 40% reduction in behavioural disorders and about 30% reduction of mental health diagnosis overall. So the, the prize is a big one. The other good news is... From, from the research on resilience and psychological therapies, we can rewire and repair our brain and the way it functions. We can get insight and mastery over our psychological responses. And we can develop social bonds and trust and relationships. We can heal. The brain wants to heal. People make massive transformations in their lives. You know, I've seen it. You know, I've, I've worked as a therapist for 20 odd years. Um, we have some fantastic therapies for trauma. That's the fantastic news. They're really reliable, they're much more effective than drugs, and the only problem is they're not as readily available as perhaps they ought to be, so that's, that's part of the problem. <clears throat> the other prize is trauma-sensitive schools. So in the US where they've struggled to have students attending, they've, they've had a lot of violence, they have lots of exclusions, they have lots of behaviour problems, uh, poor educational attainment, they realised that actually if they treated their students and their families as people who are experiencing trauma, and they responded to those reactions and symptoms from a compassionate perspective and from a perspective of insight. And they kind of parked this issue of educational attainment for a while because they were trying the same things and getting, expecting different results. It wasn't working. They saw, by parking this obsession with educational attainment, by focusing on emotional well-being and trust and safety, they saw less exclusions, less violence, more graduation, better attendance, and as a side effect, better test scores, not the other way around. So that, that was fascinating. And I think we're starting to see that in England as well. I know Place to Be do some amazing work in terms of creating healthy, you know, healthy emotional environments. Um, but I, th I personally think education reform in this area is the single biggest thing we could do to turn this demand off. I think lots of kids don't have a safe, stable adult in their lives. They don't have a safe place. They should have it when they come to school. Most people, most of, if you look at studies of survivors of abuse, they say that very often the most important thing in their lives that helped them get free was having a safe adult relationship. Very often that's a teacher or a scout leader or a, or a football coach or someone, but it's, an, it's a safe, stable adult. And I think schools are a big part of this solution. <clears throat> so it's about reframing disease and disorder. Um, all of the things that, that we now create, these problems that we see and create this demand, drugs, food, sex, gambling, alcohol, smoking, violence, they're all ways of coping. They're all comfort-seeking behaviours. They provide short-term relief, but it doesn't last. And the impact of these behaviours and cycles is often intergenerational. I was with drug workers who were saying, this has been going on in these families for generations, you know. This is ingrained behaviour in these communities. It's, it's not a quick fix. But what we know is treating those symptoms and those behaviours, harm reduction is a great thing, but if, if we try and ask someone to give up that coping strategy without giving them something better that won't kill them or get them in jail, a better coping strategy, a sustainable one, they're not going to give it up. And we shouldn't ask them to give it up, probably, because it's, it's not very effective. It might not even be ethical. So what we have found is linking the past to the present looking at how past experiences of trauma relate to the here and now and people's difficulties in the here and now, then gives people the opportunity to think, oh, okay, I'm using these coping strategies because I'm in distress or I'm in pain or I feel empty inside or I, I want to switch off my mind from these memories. That's an opportunity then to say, okay, well, if we help you find better and more effective ways of coping, maybe you need to rely on those things less. And ultimately, it's about the relationship. And that's the thing. People can say, well, what's the treatment? Who do I refer on to? You're the, you're the treatment. You're the, 
it's the relationship that heals. That's the thing that makes the difference. And we've forgotten that. Ross Buck's an American psychologist, and he talked very much about how we over-rely on medical technology and pharmacology, and we don't recognize that in the past all we had was the relationship. That's all we had. We had the trust between two people. You go and see a healer or um, a shaman or whatever it was, or the wise person in the village, and they would use their relationship to inspire you that carrying this twig in your pocket would, would help you heal. And actually, that's what we call a placebo effect. <clears throat> people physiologically react to placebo. The body heals itself. And that's what we used to rely on, the relationship. But now we've got this dualism. You know, we have, we've had this dualism for a very long time. It still exists. We separate the mind and the body. So the case for change is we can't afford to keep doing the same things and expecting a different outcome. Um, we don't routinely ask people about their subjective experience. We don't ask them what happened to them. We treat the symptoms, not the cause. We label people, which then track stigma and, and the system response to that, not the person. It also creates learned helplessness. And ultimately, we've got a workforce crisis in the NHS and the criminal justice system. <clears throat> the current state of affairs isn't working. Waiting to be told doesn't work. We know that for sure. If we expect someone to tell us the most, most personal, often shameful, fearful experiences, and they don't think anyone's going to believe them, they've been scared of, of saying anything, they're worried about the consequences. If we don't ask someone, they won't tell us. It doesn't happen. Very, very rare that someone spontaneously discloses. Some studies suggest of survivors that it's took between 9 and 16 years for them to disclose. Other studies have found that if you ask people routinely, most of them will tell you what's happened to them. If you don't ask them, they tend not to disclose. The other worry is if you start doing this, if you start asking people, you will create enormous demand, enormous tidal wave of demand for specialist psychotherapies that we haven't got. Um, actually, we see... The opposite of that, this can reduce demand. Um, Fleeting Anders' work, they looked at 130,000 people in the Kaiser Health Plan. They looked at what happened after they were asked about adversity. So compared to the year before, the year after they were asked about ACEs in the context of the health assessment, that cohort of 130,000 people used doctor's office visits, 11%, sorry, um, doctor's office visits 35% less and A&E visits 11% less than the year before. And Vincent Fleety firmly believes this is about the act of unburdening. This is the act of disclosure, of telling someone, taking that trusting step, and then realising that nothing bad happens, that that person in a position of status and authority accepts and validates what you've said. And then you've got a great opportunity to say to somebody, thank you, I believe you, that was really brave of you to tell me, and I'm here to talk through this with you, and I can help you if, if you want me to. But we don't have to, it's up to you. It's about, we'll go at your pace, but I'm here if you want me to. And very often you get the opportunity then to say, this wasn't your fault, because people usually blame themselves. And that's really therapeutic. That's an epiphany. That's a, that's a start of a change process. And people think it's, it's just too simple, isn't it? It's just too simple. But this makes a difference for lots of people, simply that act. I'll skip this bit because we haven't got a lot of time. Um, it just basically says what I've just told you is true. But from a scientific, <laughs> scientific perspective. <clears throat> so implementing routine inquiry... Feasible, acceptable across a whole load of settings. I've done this with health visitors, with family support teams, with children's drug services, with um, women's domestic abuse services, with women's services that help women reintegrate in community after being in prison. All kinds of settings. It's entirely possible and feasible. But you need management support. You need good supervision. We need to look after the people that are doing this. We need proper systems and processes. We need to plan it properly. We need to do it as a whole team. If you follow that recipe, which I've developed over the, a number of years through trial and error, um, it sticks. It becomes sustainable. And most of the services I've worked with over the years are still doing this. It, it's not, most psychosocial training makes a difference for about six months, then it just tails off. They go, people go back to what they did before. So unless you work with the organisation to create the conditions for change, you get a, a short-term effect. What we want is a durable effect, but this is day-to-day -day practice. So... I won't, I won't go into the lessons for implementation, but what services tell us five years on is that participants who came on the training didn't know about the potential benefits of this knowledge and science. Um, they told us that they felt more confident and knowledgeable to ask people who they were working with about adversity after the training. They didn't see a huge demand for specialist services. And 
most people just wanted that person they disclosed to, to talk to them about it, to reassure them, to say, I'm here for you, I'm not going anywhere, but if you want to talk about it, you know, let's do that. And if you need something else, we'll try and organize that as well. The other really cool thing was it, it seemed to improve therapeutic clients. Therapeutic clients is one of the biggest predictors of change. Um, again, what's that? It's fancy language for being on the same page and having a trusting relationship. Um, and the other really smart thing is that people, when you ask parents about their own adversity, they immediately reflect on their children. And they go, oh my God, I had no idea that I was potentially harming my children. And I don't want that for my kids. And then they realize they don't know what good looks like because they haven't had that themselves. And then they start asking for help. So in the family support team in Blackburn, parents go from, I don't want to know you, you just want to take my kids off me because you think I'm crap, to, oh my God, I want to do something different. Can you help me? And that's fantastic. That's miraculous. So the summary from one of the, uh, one of the family support workers was, it's not suddenly changed 30 odd years of behavior for that family, but it's, and it hasn't undone all those experiences, but it's made them question what are they now putting their children through? What aces are they putting in front of their children? And it started a journey for them. So this can also be very preventative because parents then are more motivated to give their children a better experience and a better opportunity. So what does this mean for schools specifically? Statistics tell us that in every single class, in every single school, you're going to have a number of kids who've experienced sexual abuse, domestic abuse, neglect, cyberbullying, domestic violence. Currently we wait until they're quite unwell or distressed or self-harming or, or have a diagnosable mental health problem before they get specific help. And I'm not saying we should use routine inquiry in schools. What I'm saying is we should use targeted inquiry where appropriate. We should support teachers and school staff to ask appropriately, have a sensitive conversation about adversity where appropriate. And a colleague of mine, uh, Mel Solomon, has just done a study in her school. Uh, she works in a co-ed school in East London. And she asked the young people, the children, if they wanted to take part in an ACE study. After, I know there's no time left, it's fine. But I'm going to carry on anyway. Um, uh, it's just a bit scary, though, because you're all teachers, so I'm going to get, get done after. Uh, she asked 296 14 and 15-year-olds in this school if they wanted to take part. 258 of them, that's 87%, voluntarily took part. Only five self-withdrew and only seven parents withdrew them from this study. The rest of them were off school that day, so there was only a 4% withdrawal rate from the study. What they found was the children with the higher numbers of ACEs were actually accessing more support and more therapy, which is fantastic. But they also found this was acceptable and actually desirable to young people. They were almost, um, they became activists. They, they were like, no, we must, we must do this. You need to hear what's going on in our lives. One girl who, who lost a mum to, to terminal illness on the Friday insisted on coming back into school on the Monday to take part because people felt so strongly that they needed a voice as far as this was concerned. We have a problem asking them. They have not got a problem telling us what's going on. They obviously made available support services and people knew where to go to get the help but no one came no one came to the drop-in or to ask for an appointment to say they were distressed all those students saw that as a, a reasonable and positive thing to do so that for me raises a number of questions about why we aren't giving the opportunity for children in secondary school potentially to talk to us about what's going on um, so I know I haven't got any time but trauma sensitive school is really about buffering the impact of toxic stress that they bring in from outside of school, or in my case, preventing that toxic environment from persisting in school. It's about helping traumatised children learn in the classroom. And I think if you have a whole school approach, it can be really effective. But it's, it's, it's about timing. It's about you know planning this ahead. And it's not going to work if you've got teachers and, and staff who are feeling not looked after and burnt out. And this is seen as just another initiative. It's just another thing that we're being asked to do. Um, but ultimately, it's, I, th I think it's about prioritising emotional development over educational attainment. So I've worked with a school in Blackburn that have done this. And the Ofsted report said, staff in the school gauge the emotional well-being of pupils at the start of every day. 
And then it's followed up by highly trained support staff who are on hand to assist the pupils if they've got any concerns or worries. So they really prioritise emotional well-being. They also pointed out that school leaders have a really clear focus on pupils' well-being, particularly mental health. And even small changes in pupils' behaviour are regularly discussed in meetings and they carefully consider what the root cause is. So this is their modus operandi now. So the prize is learning to get along with children and adults. That's the prize. Self-regulation, self-soothing, reciprocation, appreciation, compassion. They're the things that a trauma-sensitive school focuses on. Focusing on those things doesn't always lead to better test scores, but very often it does, because those things are a better predictor of adult life satisfaction than academic achievement. And I am going to finish with this study by Richard Layard from the London School of Economics, who looked at a life course model of well-being, followed a cohort of people from birth to age 34, looked at them through school. And they found that the most powerful predictor of childhood, sorry, the most powerful childhood predictor of adult life satisfaction is the child's emotional health. It's closely followed by the conduct, which makes sense. The least powerful predictor of a child's adult life satisfaction was their intellectual development at the point they leave school. And I love the modest statement, they, they, this may have implications for educational <laughs> policy. Yeah, do you think so? Yeah. We're focusing all of our efforts and time on the things that give us the least outcomes later on in terms of society and people being happy and living healthy lives. Yeah, quite important. So that, for me, that was mind-blowing. You know, we neglect emotional health and well-being because teachers are forced to focus on educational attainment. Um, I think the system needs rebalancing massively. I could talk about that a lot. I realise I haven't got much time, but that, that for me is fundamental. And I'll get back to the, I'll get back to the, uh, the story, the personal biography. Um, I wish I'd kept that jumper, actually. It's beautiful. It's a beautiful thing. So I did a get from this kind of no-hoper situation. Um, I couldn't even get a job making shovels to dig the coal that wasn't available anymore. Terrible situation. But my life trajectory changed when I went to sixth form. Because I went from that scary, unsafe environment where I hated it and just wanted to escape, where I felt threatened all the time, to a place where I felt safe. Um, I felt appreciated. I felt respected by my teachers. They actually expected me to learn and they encouraged me. It was completely different. And I'd blame myself for being stupid, for maybe not having worked hard enough, for not having paid attention. I blame myself for that. But what I didn't realise is that my environment was affecting my ability to learn. That was, a, that was an epiphany for me. And the people that, 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 were, that I was at school, that I sixth form with, could manage themselves better. They could respect boundaries. They, they were able to tolerate being in a class and learning. And rules were applied. This, this, this trauma-sensitive school thing isn't about just letting kids off with whatever they want. And, oh, it's, isn't it a shame? It's not about that. It's about holding to account with compassion. I think that's really important. It's about working through things with people. But the school culture can be transformational. For me, I got my confidence, well, I started to rebuild my confidence. I'm 47 now, and I'm, still, I'm on my fourth therapist, so um, I wore them out. They're all, in, they're all rocking in a corner somewhere. <laughs> um, but I found I could learn. My self-esteem started to develop, and my previous lack of entertainment, I realised, wasn't entirely my fault. <clears throat> so I passed maths and, o, and English, O-level, within three months of being at the school, which was brilliant. And they said, oh, why don't you do A-levels? Because you're clearly quite smart. And I went... Oh, I never thought about that. I was told I couldn't do that. I wouldn't be up to it. No, no, you should. Why don't you give it a go? And, that, and the rest is history, really. Um, so I suppose the other thing was that I joined a karate club. That was good. I learned to fight at age 16. No one's going to bully me anymore. I learned to fight a bit late in the day. If you're going to learn, to, you know, learn earlier on when you can, it'd be better. And I carried on. I overcompensated. I'm 47. I've been doing it since I was 16. So I could keep your head clean off at this point. <laughs> <coughs> but, uh, yeah. Too little, too late, I think. Um, but I suppose my summary is that environmental factors changed. My resilience grew. It wasn't one-way traffic. Um, I altered my direction, and I guess my educational attainment at leaving school wasn't, wasn't a good predictor of my life satisfaction in my 30s and 40s. That's the key message. But it still drives the school system. Schools and school staff have got the power to change lives. It drives, you know, this impact of toxic stress can be buffered. You know, emotional maturity and resilience are the goals, I think, when you leave school. Not having exam results. It doesn't really predict much. So I think 
we have to embrace that knowledge, and I think becoming trauma sensitive means prioritizing those safe, stable relationships. Kids often don't have them elsewhere. You know, prioritizing nurturing, prioritizing emotional development, prioritizing safety over education attainment. And of course, when necessary, asking the right questions. I'll stop there. Thank <laughs> you.